Uh, professor Deacon is a professor of law at the University of Cambridge, specializing in labor law, private law, company law, law and economics, and EU law. Uh, he's a program director at the Cambridge Center for Business Research and associate faculty member at the Judge Business School at Cambridge as well. His books include Tort Law, Labor Law, uh, The Law of the Labor Market, Industrialization, Employment, and Legal Evolution. And he was elected to the Fellowship of the British Academy in 2005. In May 2010, Professor Deacon, writing with John Armour, Priya Lele, and Matthias Seams, received the Allen and Overy Law Prize in the 2010 working paper competition run by the European Corporate Governance Institute. And he also received the Governance Institute's prize in 2009. Today he will be talking to you about the corporation as commons, uh, offering you a fundamental rethinking of the role of the corporation as the legal form of business enterprise, what it means to act in the, in the best interests of a business and a corporation. And this is a topic that I should say as director of the Center for Law and the Contemporary Workplace, we're very pleased to work uh, in conjunction with Paul Miller to present to you. It has important implications for uh, life in the boardroom and in contemporary workplaces, particularly post-financial crisis of 2008. So I won't say any more, and I'll invite Simon Deacon to speak to you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Kevin. I'm, I'm very grateful indeed to the, the faculty here at Queen's University, to Kevin and to Paul for this invitation um, and for the, the firm's sponsorship. Um, I'm very grateful for the chance to give this lecture in this very distinguished uh, series. What I'd like to um, talk about today is the notion of the, the corporation as commons. Um, and let me say something first of all about what I, what I intend to say in this lecture. Uh, the plan of my lecture before getting on to the, the detail. I want to begin by, by thinking about the role of model building, um, both in economics and in law. Why do we need models? How does that help us, both as social scientists and also as, as practicing lawyers and as legal academics? And then say something about um, competing models of the, of the firm in, in economics and law. And I want in particular to talk about the dominant model of the firm in the, the economics of law, especially in, in Anglo-American systems and common law systems more generally, the so-called shareholder primacy model, a model which has um, informed corporate law scholarship very much for the past 20, 30 years, and I, I maintain has also um, importantly influenced practice. But then say something about why that, that model of the business enterprise um, may not quite be fit for purpose anymore, in particular in the light of the, the global financial crisis. Then to um, offer a different conception of the firm, uh, which I'll explain in more detail as I go along, the notion of the, the corporation as commons, uh, a common resource. Uh, and I want here to draw upon law and economics literature and property rights literature, uh, in particular uh, on the work of the, the recent Nobel Prize winning uh, economist and political scientist um, Eleanor Ostrom awarded the Nobel Prize two years ago. Uh, her notion of, uh, of the commons uh, as a resource uh, which is maintained on the basis of a certain conception of property rights, that idea I want to explore in terms of its, of its relevance for company law and corporate governance. And I want to conclude by saying something about the implications of this way of thinking about the firm for corporate governance research and policy. So let me say something first of all about the importance of model building. Um, because as, as lawyers and more, more generally as social scientists, we, we have to use models to explain complex phenomena, uh, phenomena in society, but also um, legal phenomena that we, we have to deal with, um, ideas or concepts or ideal types we're always employing, always using in an effort to organize our material. But there's a, a, a big debate, I think, in the um, in the social sciences and in the philosophy of science about the role of models and in particular about whether they should be realistic. And there's a, a, a tradition of thought here which says that um, 
basically a model of a given phenomenon like the business firm. It doesn't need to be uh, a realistic description or a thick description of the empirical reality of that phenomenon. Um, a model is essentially there to generate questions or propositions or hypotheses for us to research empirically. And a good model generates lots of interesting hypotheses or claims and permits empirical testing and also falsification because science advances, and social science is no different, social science advances by identifying um, hypotheses for testing and not by verifying them but by falsifying them do we, do we advance our understanding. So a model is not directly derived from observation of empirical reality. A model is derived from fundamental theoretical postulates or axioms. Um, those axioms generate hypotheses. They're then empirically tested. And it's only when a sufficient body of evidence is accumulated against a particular model that we might think of discarding it. And only really when a better model comes along that we completely replace one model with another. So we shouldn't reject a model just because it's um, in some way counterintuitive. It doesn't reflect what we think of as reality. And nor do we reject a model because one or two, or maybe even more than that, empirical bodies of work refute aspects of that model. A model is only defeated by a better model at the end of the day. And that's how science, that's how science advances. So of course, in the area of law and economics, um, we're used to thinking about, for example, the rational actor as the basis for our model of human behavior. Um, individuals in a market setting or maybe in a setting of an organization, uh, the firm, uh, individuals behave rationally. That is to say, on the whole, they behave in such a way as to express their self-interest. Um, this rational actor model often doesn't tally with our understanding of the real world in which actors are confronted with environments which are open and complex, um, difficult to compute, fine. That rational actor model over time has been amended by advances such as those we associate with behavioral law and economics. So now we say, actually, for the most part, individual actors act with bounded rationality. Um, they can't foresee the future. There are limits to their computational capacity. The environment is complex and open-ended. There's a very slow process by which one model is questioned by empirical researchers, may be replaced by another. Only now, really, are social scientists beginning to use models of bounded rationality and so-called ecological rationality to understand the relationship between agents and a complex environment. That's just one example. Now, the problem with these theory-driven models, I think, is that they can be very slow to change. Because, as I've said, um, the mere fact that a model doesn't reflect reality is, according to this body of thought, this way of thinking, not a grounds for rejecting it. But the difficulty with many such models, especially in the social sciences, I think, is that if they're driven by theory and they're driven by axioms which can't themselves be questioned, okay, the axioms are beyond question until we replace one theory by another. You can falsify a particular hypothesis, okay, but the, the fundamental underlying axioms are much, much slower to change. This means that um, a lot of theory-driven models are resistant to empirical observation, and they clearly run the risk of producing empirically irrelevant and misleading results until a, better, a, until a better model comes along. And that's the position I think we're in at the moment with the theory of the firm. Now, a, a different way of thinking about this is to refer to so-called data-driven models. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, the, the whole purpose of a model is, of course, to generate hypotheses, um, whether we're acting as lawyers or social scientists. Um, we need models to generate um, empirically testable hypotheses. But data-driven models are more sympathetic to empirical discovery and empirical observation than theory-driven models are. Um, theory-driven models, and they do exist in economics and in econometrics, try to embed um, phenomena from the world that we observe in the ideal types or the concepts or the verbal formula we use to construct a model. And in particular, rather than discarding a model only when a better, fully fledged model comes along, um, social scientists who use data-driven models tend to believe in a kind of incremental adaptation of those models to new evidence as it appears. Models are periodically adjusted in the light of new evidence. 
Now, of course, um, lawyers don't just use models in order to understand the world and to engage in empirical testing. Um, lawyers use verbal models, concepts, to help them make sense of what's otherwise very often a very large, dense amount of judicial or statutory material. We, we need concepts to organise our legal material. And also, lawyers and legal academics are, are I think, involved in a, a normative and not just a positive um, exercise. We're not just interested in understanding the world. A lot of legal academic work and also legal practice work is normative in the sense of making a case for something or a case against something. And here, um, models are very important, I think, in shaping normative work. And here I think it's even more important that the models we use when arguing a particular normative case are, are informed by what we can understand about the social world and are not based upon dogma and theory alone. So I think in particular in the law and economics area, which is a hybrid of social science and legal, institutional and normative analysis, I think we need to have models which are empirically grounded. The shareholder primacy model um, is a dominant model of the firm in, in economics and a dominant model in corporate law, uh, which is used to explain features of corporate law systems today. And that, that model owes a lot to the work done by by economists and by lawyer economists uh, writing since the early 1980s. These um, social scientists and lawyers have made a fundamental contribution to understanding corporate law. So what I have to say is not a rejection um, of everything they've done, um, and I wouldn't be able to give this lecture had it not been for the contribution of, of, of economists like Michael Jensen or um, legal scholars like, like Henry Hansman and many other law and economic scholars well, what, what they've done is produce a model which clearly has a lot of traction because it very, very, very heavily influences the way we think about corporate law today. And yet 30 or 40, 30 or 40 years ago, we would have thought about it differently, I think. So what are the key features, features of, of the so-called shareholder primacy model? Well, Hansman and Crackman in their 2001 paper, The End of History in Corporate Law, identified four or five key, key features of the so-called shareholder primacy model and adapting their terminology a little bit, because they, they, they referred to um, the shareholder primacy model to some degree in normative terms. Okay, they said company law should do this, but if we just regard this and tweak it a little bit as a positive model of what company law does, we would say, according to the shareholder primacy model, within company law, ultimate control over the corporation vests with the shareholder class, fine. The managers of the corporation are charged with the obligation to manage the corporation in the interests of its shareholders. Um, other corporate constituencies or stakeholders, so-called, um, such as employees, suppliers, customers and others, have their interests protected not by company law, but by contractual or regulatory means. They don't directly participate in corporate governance. They have no say over the election of directors. They don't vote on the strategic direction of the firm and so on and so forth. But they are protected by employment law, um, consumer law, and so on and so forth. Finally, the market value of the publicly traded corporation, the company whose shares are listed on the stock exchange, that market value is the, the principal measure of the shareholder's interest. So this is a shareholder-orientated model of the company, which um, diagrammatically works like this, that the shareholders um, vest control over the assets of the firm in the board initially and then in the managers or the employees of the corporation more generally uh, and accountability runs in the other direction. So the management of the company is very clearly accountable first of all to the board um, and the board is ultimately accountable to the shareholders. The shareholders of course have the right to appoint the directors and different legal systems express that right in different ways. In some systems it's a very strong right. A, in the English system, British system, the shareholders always have the right to uh, dismiss a director on a simple majority vote of the voting shares once a year at the AGM. That right can't be removed by statute in other di jurisdictions. In Delaware, for example, it's much more difficult to sack a director by those means. But generally speaking, it's only the shareholders who have the right to hold the directors accountable. And the role of the board in the Anglo-American, Anglo-American Anglo common law world is to manage the corporate assets with a view to returning value long-term long to the shareholders. And the board delegates that task to employees and managers and monitors the way in which they perform that task. Right. So accountability runs down. Um, control runs down, rather. Accountability runs back up. This is a basic model. And of course, in this diagram, 
there's no place for any of the other stakeholders at all. They just don't figure. So company law doesn't recognise the employees, for example, as significant players, unless they also happen to be shareholders or they happen to be um, directors. Okay. Um, so the idea that the managers are the agents of the shareholders... Um, well, all right, what about this statement then from Milton Friedman writing in the early 1970s, a very famous article in the um, New York Times about corporate social responsibility. He basically said the only social responsibility of a corporation is, is to make as much money as possible. Okay. So here was a famous article written at the point where corporate law was shifting from a managerialist or post-stakeholder conception very much to a shareholder value orientated conception. Milton Friedman said in a free enterprise private property system, a corporate executive is an employee of the owners of the business. He has direct responsibility to his employers. That responsibility is to conduct the business in accordance with the desires of the, um, his employers, uh, which will generally be to make as much money as possible while conforming to the basic rules of society. Of course, that's an important caveat. Uh, the manager is the agent of the individuals who own the corporation. Now, there are probably about five or six fundamental legal errors, aren't there, in that statement. It is a fundamental misdescription, even now, of the legal structure of the firm. A corporate executive is plainly not an employee of the owners of the business. The executive is, of course, an employee of the corporation, not of the individual shareholders. That's absolutely clear. He has direct responsibility to his employers. No, he doesn't have responsibility to the shareholders as such. His duties are owed to the company. It's a separate legal person. Um, the director, not necessarily a manager, is an agent not of the shareholders, but of the company. That's certainly the position in English law. It's probably still more or less the position, isn't it, in Delaware law. I know there's some ambiguity around the edges on this point. Occasionally, directors can owe duties directly to shareholders, but normally they don't. They owe them to the company, not to the shareholders. The responsibility is to conduct, conduct the business in accordance with the desires of the shareholders. No, sorry, absolutely not. Um, Delaware law, UK law, are very clear that the duty of managing the company vests in the board, and the board is, of course, replaceable by the shareholders, but the shareholders have no right to manage the company. That duty is vested in the board, and the board delegates it to the employees or managers, and the officers of the company have a status within company law. They have duties, they have obligations, which are, as I say, to the company. It is not in any sense, in any system, including the common law systems, the duty of the directors or of the managers to maximise shareholder value. This is absolutely not the case, and certainly it's not the duty to make as much money as possible. Absolutely not. So it's perfectly open to a board of directors to decide where to strike the balance between short-term and long-term returns to shareholders, a decision to invest now in productive assets such as employee training or assets of another sort, as opposed to distributing money now by way of dividends or share buybacks to shareholders, is normally within the discretion of a board, according to the common law legal systems, and also, for that matter, even more so, in the civil law. The manager is the agent of the individuals who own the corporation? No. That's fundamentally not the case, as I've already said. So this model, um, which is not at all actually the Hansman-Crackman model, their model is, of course legally more sophisticated than this and avoids the obvious errors. But there is a certain continuity, isn't there, between them. This model in Friedman's version is just fundamentally wrong. So Milton Friedman's, Friedman's description of the law is totally false, says uh, Jean-Philippe Robet in an important recent paper. Why is it false? It's a false description of the world because if Friedman were right and corporate personality just didn't matter and the duties of directors and of managers were owed directly to the owners of the property in the firm... We wouldn't have separate corporate personality. We wouldn't have asset partitioning, as Henry Hansman and Rainier Crackman describe it, dividing the assets of the firm from the assets of the shareholders. We wouldn't have any of that. There'd be no possibility of corporate groups, and nearly all large enterprises are multi-corporate enterprises with a parent subsidiary structure. We wouldn't have any of that. So we wouldn't have all the mechanisms we actually do have to allow for the concentration of capital inside the enterprise and therefore for the division of labour to exist within the corporation between employees and shareholders and others. So if you want to, ha to accept the advantages for our economy of the concentration of capital which goes with corporate personality in a world of positive transaction costs, we must deal with the reality of the firm as it is. And of course, FEMA's model um, fails at the first level as a data-driven model because it's so plainly at odds with what we know legally 
about the firm. This is not how the firm is legally structured, but I go further and say it's not how the firm, the modern enterprise, operates either in, in the economy. So let me say what I mean, first of all, by an alternative model in terms of defining some basic terms. Let me define the firm. Let me define uh, the corporation, because the two are different, and a lot of what I had to say flows from this difference between them. The firm, the organisation which produces goods and services, which brings together physical, human and virtual assets, um, allows for specialisation, endows a particular group of agents, the managers, with responsibility for managing those assets, which has organisational capacity which individuals do not have, which therefore has the possibility of creating value both for its immediate stakeholders, those who invest capital, labour and other resources in the firm, but also because of its organisational capacity, has the power to do good for society, to create value for third parties, positive externalities in the way that individuals can't do, but also because of that organisational capacity can harm third parties in a way which individuals rarely can. This is the firm defined economically or functionally in terms of what it does. Um, the firm as a social entity, a productive entity, has these characteristics, I would suggest. The corporation, what is that, is a legal device that we lawyers use to um, structure the firm. The corporation is a legal concept, because we as lawyers would, would, would pretty much accept this. The corporation is a legal device um, which gives the firm life, which makes it possible for firms to exist in market economies. Um, without the, the corporation, without company law, it would be very, very difficult for firms today to take the form that they do. Um, property rights, limited liability rules, asset partitioning, all those things really can't be recreated by contract alone. Right? Very, very complicated to bind third parties in particular just using the basic building blocks of property and contract. Company law does that, of course. It sets up a very, very complex and variegated set of rules determining the rights of the insiders and the rights of the outsiders. And this template, this model, uh, has come into existence over many centuries uh, as a consequence, if you like, of the co-evolution of modern industry with the legal system. The legal system, to a large degree, has, of course, been responding to the needs of businesses, the needs of business people, the demands of society upon the firm. So I'm not saying that the legal system somehow created the firm alone. I'm saying the legal system functionally responded to the need for something to allow the firm to exist. The firm has co-evolved with the corporation, but we must never confuse the two. The firm as a productive entity, the corporation as a legal form. Without the corporation as a legal form, we'd struggle to reinvent the firm, or the, the public corporation in the economic sense, as we now know it. And there's, all, there's no need to do that, by the way, because we have company law. We don't need to start from scratch or do a thought experiment and say, could we manage without company law? There's no point in doing that because company law has evolved, has been invented and designed, and has evolved to some degree spontaneously to support this process. Um, of course, we can't rerun history to know exactly what we'd get if we didn't have company law. OK, fine. But I think it's very artificial to say company law is trivial. Company law is meaningless. And really, we could do all this with just contract and tort and property law. Okay. So the corporation, without it, we probably wouldn't see firms doing what they do today, creating value, but also sometimes creating, creating real problems. Right. And we have to accept that the corporation as a legal form isn't necessarily perfect. It does something, something's very well allows large-scale productive organisation to, to function. But it also, of course, allows for um, lobbying by organisations and for creative avoidance or tax avoidance and other things, which are a very clear net loss to society. Um, the functions of corporate law. Here I'm drawing, of course, on the, the seminal work of Hansman and Crackman and, and other authors, and I think this is now very, very widely accepted. Uh, corporate personality... Um, as I've already said, allows for asset partitioning. The assets of the firm are a pool set aside from the assets of the individual shareholders or other uh, contributors to the firm. So the creditors of those individuals, a shareholder's creditor, for example, has no right to go against the firm's assets. Right? This is very important, but often overlooked, isn't it? Um, and this facilitates bonding by third parties who want to deal with the firm, I want to know that those assets will continue. And, of course, uh, corporate personality depersonalizes the ownership of the firm. It means that banks and others can deal with the firm, knowing that 
the firm doesn't actually depend upon the fate of one person. The firm is immortal. Once it has corporate personality, it's not immortal if it just depends upon a sole trader to organise it or to make contracts with all, all other parties. So corporate personality is a very important device for facilitating bonding, an extension of the scale of the organisational capacity of the firm, asset partitioning, the whole of insolvency law, in a sense the whole of employment law flows from this basic fact, because employees, banks, contract with the company, not with the, the individual managers normally, although they can also do that if they want to. Limited liability protects the shareholders against certain claims, of course. This means, critically, that shareholders do not have to manage the firm. With limited liability, um, the wealth of each shareholder is irrelevant. Imagine a world without limited liability, then you'd really want your fellow shareholders to be as wealthy as possible, because if something goes wrong, they'll have more money to pay the firm's creditors. In, the same, in a way, for example, that in the late 19th century, many British banks had unlimited liability, and effectively there was a wealth qualification for becoming a shareholder. Only the wealthy could become shareholders, because there was no point in having a fellow shareholder who wasn't very, very rich. Poor shareholder wasn't much good in the crisis. With, unlimit with limited liability, of course, our personal wealth is irrelevant. We can all hold shares, and actually we don't need to monitor, then, our fellow shareholders in the same way, and we don't actually need to monitor managers to quite the same degree either. If we diversify our holdings across many, many companies, as pension funds allow us to do. So actually, limited liability, if that didn't exist, we probably wouldn't see the stock market as we, as we now know it. We wouldn't see ownership being diversified through pension funds and institutions and mutual funds. We as shareholders, all of us have an indirect interest today in the way limited and listed companies are run as members of a pension fund, perhaps, or as owners of an insurance contract, we can be reasonably passive, actually, for the most part. And that's a great advantage. Although passivity can be bad, it's also the basis for liquidity in the stock market. It's the basis for a division of labour between investors and employees. That's not possible without limited liability. So capital allocation, diversification, risk allocation, these are a function of limited liability. Delegated management. Now, the firm, as I say, has these agents not agents of the shareholders alone, but the agents who are given the task of running the firm, specialisation, delegated management, almost every legal system, every company law system says the board has responsibility for management, not the shareholders, and they delegate to a specialised cadre of corporate officers. The rule of delegated management facilitates coordination. And what the managers must do is bring together, as I say, the uh, physical, personal and virtual assets of the organisation and somehow combine them to make a surplus. That's what organisations do, to produce a surplus. And if they don't, if they don't produce a surplus, they die, of course. Okay, but that's, that, that's what they do. And finally, transferability of shares facilitates capital liquidity and, again, the presence of a stock market as we now know it. But, of course, there are other areas of law which also affect the firm, in the sense that I've defined it, the productive organisation. So, if we want to find out more about management, for example, we see very little within company law. It's a very surprising fact. When I first studied company law in Cambridge in the early 1980s, I anticipated learning about management and what it did. And, of course, there's virtually nothing about management in a company law course. Right? What do managers do? Um, we know what directors do, and sometimes directors are managers. And, of course, company law has something to say about corporate officers, but not a great deal. Uh, company law is basically facilitative. It doesn't prescribe how boards should delegate the managerial function. Not, not much, anyway. Employment law has an enormous amount to say about management. It has a lot to say about the conditions under which management can coordinate the different labour inputs without the need to contract or recontract continuously with the employees. But above all, um, areas of law like health and safety, environmental protection, um, enterprise liability law, they will actually identify managers as, as, as legal actors. If you want to see where, where a manager is in law, one has to go very often to health and safety law to see a particular law saying that manager doing that job with that responsibility has these health and safety responsibilities. And those, those are fundamentally an aspect of their managerial role, their role in coordinating um, inputs. It's often said that the law is indifferent to the issue of corporate social responsibility, and of course that was Milton Friedman's argument. But actually, enterprise liability law, tort law, already acknowledge the principle of corporate social responsibility because they treat enterprises differently from individual actors when it comes to working out the responsibilities of the um, employer or the defendant in a tort case when it comes to issues of enterprise liability. We do tend to treat enterprises differently from personal defendants, and that's right because enterprises 
have the capacity to absorb risk, to insure against it, to deal with it organisationally in a different way from the way in which individuals have, have the capacity to organise risk. I'm not saying individuals aren't always insured or they don't diversify risk, but enterprises do it in a distinctive way, which I think enterprise liability law recognises. And clearly, of course, it goes without saying tax law treats corporate enterprises as distinct from any purposes, competition law, dealing with the role of companies within markets and avoiding market abuse. These are, again, areas where the law defines what enterprise does. And they're just as important as corporate law is to understanding the way the legal system structures the firm. Of course, at the same time, um, as I've said, not everything is good about this story. Um, the corporation is a legal form which enables real people, right, real shareholders, uh, real managers, to do things through a corporate form they couldn't do as individuals. Right? Um, so once one is endowed with the uh, capacity which corporate law gives the organisation, there are all sorts of negative things that can take place that wouldn't otherwise take place. Right? So there's, a, there's a dark side to this. Um, corporate, the corporate form is, of course, used to create the multi-corporate enterprise group structures which are used to facilitate the raising of capital and to diversify risk, that's fine. The use of the corporate group is an essential part of modern-day corporate practice and advice. But, of course, the very same techniques for asset partitioning and liability shifting and splitting can be used to avoid liability to third parties, particularly in a tort law context, um, in a way which is unsatisfactory. Again, tax avoidance, creative compliance... That's a major issue. Think about the Enron case, another major corporate governance scandals of the past few years, the use there of corporate entities um, for the purpose of avoiding regulatory oversight and for the purposes of, on the one hand, yes, sure, uh, maximising leverage and capital efficiency, but also avoiding certain legal commitments which led to a loss of transparency. This is the dark side of corporate form. Again, clearly, the existence of corporate form makes lobbying possible by organised collectivities of capital in a way that wouldn't otherwise be the case. So the Enron case, again, is a good example. One reason Enron happened was that corporate entities had lobbied very strongly for deregulation of many of the rules which would have prevented the Enron collapse. And the same is true of um, lobbying in the run-up to the global financial crisis in 2008. The major investment banks lobbied for the end to the Glass-Steagall Act and the end of other regulatory devices which were there to limit the harm to third parties that might arise from corporate activity. So lobbying can result in laws which are dysfunctional. And I think the critical point I want to make here is not that lobbying is good or bad. The, the point I simply want to make is lobbying takes on a different scale when companies do it as opposed to it being done by individuals. Of course, in that regard, it's also significant that there's a big debate going on, as you know, about the circumstances under which companies themselves can contribute to Political funds are a huge issue in, in many countries. Now, I think that the, the problem is that we've got a, a model of the, the company which very much stresses um, shareholder primacy and sees the company as the property of the shareholders. Um, and this is a model which doesn't capture the essence of the modern corporation. It's descriptively false because it can't deal with a number of features of the firm, the sort I'm, I, I've been discussing. But it's also a misleading model for policy, because it means we tend to turn a blind eye to some of the things I've just been mentioning, um, abuses of the corporate form, and also, of course, by marginalising the role of stakeholders in the firm, the predominant model marginalises the sense in which their contribution is critical to the maintenance of the enterprise, not necessarily the corporation, but certainly the enterprise as a productive resource. And if we neglect that then we are neglecting the conditions which need to be in place to make the company sustainable as a resource. And that's really the notion of the commons, and that's where the idea of the commons comes in. So what do I mean by, by the commons? The commons is essentially a collectively managed resource. Um, the examples normally given in the literature are things like irrigation systems, fisheries, forests. So we talk principally about a natural resource, that's where we begin. Um, and in the mid-1960s, uh, the, the notion was developed of the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons essentially predicts that natural resources which are collectively, or, or collectively owned or owned in common will be depleted by self-seeking action because each individual agent has an incentive to free ride on the others. And if there are no individual property rights in the commons, 
There's a misalignment of private and collective incentives um, and no internalization of costs and benefits arising from um, activity. So the, the example given by Garrett Hardin would be the overgrazing of common land by each ind individual farmer. Collectively, of course, nobody wants to see overgrazing occur and the resource depleted, but no individual has an incentive to, to take action. Unless, Hardin said, two conditions are met, or one of two conditions, one would be some Leviathan-type state enforcement of rules about sharing the resource. So the state is one answer. Powerful enforcement of rules about sharing. The other possibility is the market. The market can decide, as it does everything else, by resource allocation based on supply and demand, internalization on the basis of private property rights. Law and economic scholars put these two ideas together, Leviathan and the free market, to come up with the notion of legally supported property rights. Individual property rights in collective assets were the answer. And so, of course, this notion inspired deregulation, but also privatization in particular, taking state-owned assets, in a sense assets held in common, creating private property rights in those assets, making them tradable by listing the companies concerned, producing a free market. This was seen as the answer to the problem of the commons. Um, now, the work done by um, Eleanor Ostrom and her co-researchers on the commons since the, the 19, um, late 1980s has challenged this. So what Ostrom's work has shown um, is that actually the, the commons doesn't depend upon either Leviathan or the market. Um, very often the commons functions on the basis of widely applied social norms at the level of a particular community which manages the resource both for itself and for future generations. And that this web of rules um, is often undermined both by the state and by the market. So her claim is that very often decentralised autonomous rulemaking by those who have a direct stake in the future of the commons provides more sustainable uh, rules and a more sustainable basis for the development of the commons than the alternative of Leviathan or uh, the market. And she identifies these five um, property rights in the commons, rights of access, withdrawal, management exclusion and alienation. Some combination of these rights will exist within a commons in such a way to make it sustainable. Now this, this research is based on now hundreds of case studies, very detailed empirical research. This, is, this I think really is data driven modelling. Empirical research based on field work, um, often in a developing country context, getting access to rule systems which are inaccessible unless the researcher gets quite close up to the data. Very often there are no data sets, there are no publicly available data sets with these data in them. Um, to some degree it's inductive, fair enough, but also um, there's development of a, a model in response to empirical findings all the way through this project, which is now more or less um, 30 or so years old. Um, and so these property rights are not the product of um, introspection or conceptual analysis. They're, they're distilled from many, many um, thousands of hours of case study research. Um, and what's interesting is that Ostrom's work emphasizes that the last of these, alienation, the right to sell your property right, is perhaps the least important. Okay. So this goes very much against the law and economics tradition, which is to see alienation rights as key to, to individual property rights. The right to sell your asset in an open market setting is critical. But this body of work says actually you can have property rights inside a commons without the right of alienation. Those property rights take the form of access rights, management rights, exclusion rights, and withdrawal rights. So you might have the right to harvest a particular resource to draw from it in return for your contribution. You would have the right to exclude others from harvesting it, those who make no such contribution. You could vest management rights in a, in a, in a particular group of agents in order to oversee this process. Um, you can do all that without necessarily having the right to sell your claim to a third party, because very often alienation rights lead directly to depletion of, of, of the resource. But this, this is only part of the story. Um, these five property rights describe how a commons works, but the really difficult question is how to get there, how to find the right combination of property rights in a given setting to make this work, because this is no more than a framework, and the detail of these rights um, has to be worked out in practice in particular contexts, and the context will differ from one environment to another, and that will determine the, the nature of the rules to be applied. So what's really critical, I think, are these governance principles, design principles for so-called common pool resources, well-defined boundaries, 
the resource must have a clear boundary with its environment. Um, proportionality between benefits and costs. The stakeholders, or if, if you like, who contribute to the resource must be able to draw from it in proportion to their contribution. Collective choice arrangements. Each critical stakeholder group must have some say, must have some voice in the management of the resource. Monitoring. There must be rules sanctioning um, undue depletion of the resource. Um, going further, particularly interesting, I think, is the notion of local or, as she puts it, as Austrian puts it, minimal recognition of rights. Local communities or bodies of actors should on the whole have autonomy to set their own rules and through nesting there should be a relationship between um, devolved rulemaking powers at local level and higher level rulemaking designed to maintain diversity of provision across um, an area of um, resource management. Now, I think it's a, very, it's a very important and very influential and very interesting set of ideas. Um, of course, um, we, we should think about applying this to the corporation. Is it a good fit or not? Right. The research on the commons is about natural resources, about things we can see and touch, um, fisheries, irrigation, forests. But of course, there's no reason in principle why that idea should not be applied to virtual resources, to intangibles, um, and indeed to the tangible assets of the business firm. Um, the essential functional approach of this, uh, this type of economic analysis of law can be applied to settings other than those uh, concerned with natural resources. Let's just do a thought experiment. What would company law be like if we thought of the firm um, as a resource? Um, and if we thought of company law as having the role of putting in place, through design principles of a certain sort, rules to maintain that resource over time, the, sus the sustainability of the corporation for the collective interests of all its stakeholders it were to become the goal of corporate law more explicitly than it currently is, what would it look like? What would it, what would it become? I think that we can think of um, the corporation as a commons because the notion of a commons doesn't imply an ownerless form. This is a really critical point. We think of the commons as something which anybody may have access, as being ownerless. That's fundamentally not the case. What Ostrom's research has shown is that what might appear to be ownerless, what might appear to be based upon open access, normally has social norms or other well-understood conventions regulating its use. Right. The commons is not a space where there is no property. Right. But the commons is, of course, a, a space, like the firm, where multiple and competing property rights overlap with one another, where the rights of distinct groups of users collide and conflict, the rights of shareholders, the rights of employees, the rights of creditors. And the goal of the actors is to forge a body of rules and principles which maintains that common pool in existence, because each stakeholder draws from it. Each stakeholder has an interest both in their own share being preserved, but also, of course, in the commons itself being maintained over time. So the mere fact that the commons is often in a form of, a, of, of virtual assets shouldn't make us think that the analogy is completely inappropriate, and nor should we be misled by the notion of the ownerless commons. Now, the corporation itself also isn't ownerless, although its ownership is puzzling. At the core of the corporation is this thing, corporate personality. Uh, a corporate person is... Um, the subject of legal rights and obligations. It is not, I think, most company lawyers would agree, a race, a thing that can be owned. I know there are some traditions in company law in some countries which say the corporation is a thing, which is an item of property. But probably the majority of corporate lawyers in most common law and civil law jurisdictions would say the company is not, it's not a thing that can be owned. It's a person, which is the subject of rights and obligations. And as a person, it can't be owned and the assets of the firm are not the assets of the shareholders. Again, there, is, there are some heterodox views, but most of the time company lawyers say the shareholder doesn't own a pro rata share of the company's assets merely by virtue of the ownership of a share. The property right the shareholder has is, of course, the right in the share, not a pro rata claim to the assets of the firm. Those assets remain distinct in the firm's asset pool. That's the whole point about asset partitioning. The firm isn't ownerless, though, of course, Company law says this mysterious nothing, this void 
the corporate person, which we can't see or identify, owns the assets of the firm. It appears that nobody owns them. Well, of course, in reality, that's not the case. There are these multiple and conf conflicting claims. Shareholders will have claims for dividends. Employees have claims for wages. And the composite sum of all the explicit and implicit contracts around the firm are the source of the property rights inside the resource of the corporation. Not just company law, but of course company law is part of this. The law specifying shareholder rights, rights to replace the board, rights under certain circumstances to demand a dividend, right, rights to share in the surplus from production through a takeover bid. These are all set out by company law and securities law and takeover law. Equally, employment law, collective bargaining law determines the rights of the employees. Their wages are drawn from the resource of the firm. And many firms in our societies return more by way of salaries to employees than they do return to shareholders by way of dividends and share buybacks, even now. Banks, creditors, others, the taxpayer, and so forth, the fiscal authorities, these can draw from the, the corporate asset, but they mustn't do so to the extent that it is fundamentally depleted. That is the issue. So the corporation isn't ownerless, but there are many, many conflicting and overlapping claims to ownership going on within it. So the question then is whether we can devise a set of principles that would enable us to sustain these, these valued corporate resources over time in such a way as to maintain their usefulness to society at large. If we apply Ostrom's five property rights to the firm, it would be possible, I think, and I'm just sketching out how we might do this, to identify which rights within some composite of employment law, company law, tax law, and so forth, apply to the various categories that she has developed. And this would be useful, I think. This would be a useful exercise for corporate scholarship to engage on. But I think, more generally, we should think not just about these five rights, but also about the common pool resource design principles. What principles need to be in place for effective firm-level governance to take place? Because firm-level governance is only partially a matter of the law. The law is largely facilitative, and how firm-level governance is worked out in practice will be the consequence of bargaining between the different groups. Of course, company law, employment law, and so forth will set some default rules which apply in the absence of contrary agreements and some mandatory rules which are there to protect third parties and others. But a lot of what goes on within the firm, a, if, if the firm is to be effectively governed, must be done by, by the parties themselves. And here I think we should focus on these two design principles in particular that the Commons Research Programme has identified as being relevant to uh, stimulating effective governance. The principle of proportionality in collective choice and decision making. All stakeholders who contribute to the firm should have a voice, at least, in its, in its governance. And this, of course, brings us closer to a multi-stakeholder conception of the governance of the firm than to a shareholder primacy perspective. And secondly, the principle of devolution of authority should be recognised. And in particular, I think this implies within company law systems, many of which are now federal or which involve some degree of tension between federal law and state law or between transnational law and national law, there should be a principle of, of deference to local level rulemaking as far as possible within a set of meta-level principles designed to maintain the integrity of the system as a whole. So this is a, a sort of company law which would be multi-stakeholder, but also to a very large extent devolved. We devolve to the nation state from transnational decision-making bodies like the EU, like the WTO. Within company law, we devolve as far as possible to the individual stakeholder groups as far as we can to ensure effective governance and decision-making. So what I'm proposing is a conceptual rethinking of, of company law. Now, why, why does this matter? I think it matters um, because of the um, situation we're now in, because of the global financial crisis in particular, because of the questions which have been raised about shareholder-dominated corporate governance and the causes of the crisis. It's now clear, I think, from quite a large body of empirical research that, for example, the, the banks and other financial institutions which were the quickest to fail and the most important failures in the financial crisis were those which were most exposed to shareholder primacy pressures. These were the banks which tended to have independent directors who saw themselves as representatives of the shareholders. The banks with um, a high level of share option-based remuneration for executives and therefore executives who saw their role being very much as one of deal-making um, like RBS, banks involved in takeover bids, um, banks where shareholder pressure for high returns was very much felt. The banks which didn't fail tended to be run more conservatively, and many of them had come under pressure prior to the crisis of being too conservative. Okay, think about HSBC, for example. 
Um, and this pattern has been repeated across a wide range of studies, econometric studies, qualitative studies identifying the role of shareholder pressure in the crisis. And more generally, the idea that the corporation has a fairly short-term time horizon based upon quarterly performance management of the key investors who are asset managers, not necessarily um, pensioners or holders of insurance contracts because they've devolved this responsibility to asset managers who are tracked on a very regular but short-term basis. Short-termism within corporate decision-making is, of course, a consequence of a, of a mix of factors. But above all, I think, the idea that um, the company is a shareholder's property, that managers are the agents of shareholders, the idea that the company should maximise shareholder value, Milton Friedman's ideas, these are ideas which um, pushed the financial crisis um, of two or three years ago. So very often, ideas which are out of line with um, a given societal phenomenon can produce catastrophic results, and I think this has been the case. And going forward, normatively, um, we should be thinking about alternative models because um, obviously a model which severely misdescribes the world shouldn't be used for, for policy analysis. So our duty is to um, come up with a model that's both more realistic and more useful when it comes to policy planning. Now, all I've done today is sketch out an idea, but of course this, this could, could easily become um, a much more substantial research programme, I think capable of generating important hypotheses for empirical testing and also uh, policy recommendations. So what I've argued today is that the firm is a commons and so is a corporation. It's a collectively managed resource which is su subject to a number of overlapping, potentially conflicting property type claims. The sustainability of the corporation critically depends on getting its governance right. It depends on proportionality between costs and benefits or between inputs and outputs and it depends upon multi-stakeholder participation in governance. Um, I think that viewing the corporation as a commons to be sustained is maybe the first step to understanding the role the corporation itself can play in ensuring wider social and natural sustainability. Thank you very much. So I, I think if I, if I'm, thank you very much for that question. That it's useful to have the, the chance to expand on this a bit. Um, I'm not saying that every firm and every corporation is a commons in this sense. Okay. So clearly the university is a very good example of an ownerless or apparently ownerless corporation uh, which fulfills a public good um, and is a resource to be maintained, absolutely. Um, that's at one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum would, would be um, an owner-run, owner-controlled micro-firm where actually the relationship between the property of the individual and the corporate property is very, very close. And there's really no point in distinguishing between them. Right. Now, at some point along the line between the micro-firm and the, um, the public interest corporation or the university, we, we do cross the line. Okay, but the line is inevitably going to be somewhat more blurred. And I don't think this line functionally corresponds exactly to a particular legal line. Right? So as lawyers, we know there's a big difference between um, a company which is a limited, company, limited liability company, company limited by share capital on the one hand, and a company which is a mutual or cooperative on the other hand. We know there's a big difference between a company which is a private company and a public company, and between listed companies and non-listed companies. These are the distinctions we'd expect to draw as lawyers between firms of different types. I think the analogy of the commons doesn't quite map onto those distinctions and so therefore would include some listed commercial companies. Right. So if we, if we think of um, the firm um, as a productive entity which I've been talking about, 
clearly, when a firm acquires a certain longevity, when a firm acquires a certain size, it has the potential to do all the things I've been talking about, to harm, to harm and to benefit third parties, to create an enduring resource. Once it does that, it becomes subject to special rules. And you might say, well, that's pretty wishy-washy because we don't know in company law when that happens because it, you could be talking about a listed company with virtually no employees on the one hand or a large privately held company which isn't listed but which is clearly a big company which is a resource on the other hand. But my point is there are many other areas of law which do precisely draw this distinction. If one looks closely at employment law in many jurisdictions and also the law of environmental liability, there are often thresholds according to size of firm which make a difference. There are tests which courts apply of enterprise liability which do depend upon the size of the firm implicitly because they refer to the capacity of the firm to deal with risk in a certain way. There's a, there's a kind of sliding scale within enterprise liability law. Tax law treats companies of a different size differently as well as, of course, companies with a different form differently as well. So what I'm saying is it's a slightly, it's a slightly complicated picture but we can say, well, we don't lose sight of the basic underlying idea, the notion of the commons, but we're still exploring the detail of the law in some detail. Yeah, it, 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 it requires um, a kind of micro-institutional detailed legal analysis to draw all this out. But that's just to say there's a very interesting and very exciting research project. Now, Henry Hansman, of course, has already done this to some extent in his book, The Ownership of Enterprise. And I, I think it's, a, um, it's obviously an important, very important seminal contribution but I think that the emphasis in the ownership of enterprise in Henry Hansman's book is, is still very much on ownership by one of the so-called patron or stakeholder groups that he writes about. So he says the mutual is owned by the customers and the um, company limited by share capital is owned by the shareholders and so on. Okay, the retail cooperative is owned by the producers. Now, I think this is only partially true. I think Henry Hansman's analysis understates the degree to which in all those cases, yes, there is a residual class of claimants, but in every case, management is empowered to act on behalf of a, of a range of different constituencies and create value by doing that. That's true of all the forms Henry discusses in his book. And the big gap in his book, and in his seminal paper with Crackman, The Organisational Structure of the Firm, is, is the lack of a, um, an engagement with the organisational structure of the firm from the point of view of the employees. That's absolutely striking. Um, when I first picked up to read the organisational structure of the, of the corporation, I was surprised to see no reference to the organisational capacity of the firm in this sense. Right, it's a real blind spot, I think, within corporate law scholarship. Josh? Uh, first of all, thank you. A busy day. I was debating whether to come, but I'm glad I did. This is very interesting. Um, I have a question, I guess, about a, sort of a specific application of this. So one of the kind of classic problems in corporate practice, if not corporate law, is the principal agent issue, the separation of ownership and control, sure. the potential for managers to kind of loot the corporate assets for their personal benefit. And the, the classic solution to that problem, which I guess you would characterize as being directly inspired by the shareholder ownership model, is compensation for stock options. Yeah. Let's turn the managers yeah. into shareholders. Yeah. And we could say the problems that we've seen coming out of that are exactly the kinds of problems we predict based on the shareholder management. Mm -hmm. So I really loved your critique um, sort of on that application. I think it, it works beautifully. My question is, what would a commons-based solution to the separation of ownership and control problem look like? Well, of course, first of all, we'd have to get rid of all the tax advantages of share options. <laughs> we deal with that problem. Um, and achieve parity of tax treatment between different forms of executive remuneration. So probably, first of all, just reversing the obvious errors of the past 20, 30 years. Um, but, but, but of course, um, shareholders would still have a very important role to play, uh, but through voice-based mechanisms, as would employees and other corporate actors in ensuring that managers do not deplete the corporate resource. But of course, the commerce problem is basically saying depletion can be a, a problem if the agent's given the task of managing the resource, deplete it, but also if any particular stakeholder group depletes it. Right. So depletion by the shareholders is a problem for not just the other stakeholders, but for the viability and sustainability of the resource itself. So a multi-stakeholder conception of the firm would probably want to, first of all, reassert the value of managerial autonomy. It would want to say, actually, that managers are protected against undue shareholder interference and intervention. Now this is difficult because many managers no longer believe in this themselves. They believe in shareholder primacy. 
And that's partly because they've done so well out of share options, although this tends to be just the people right at the top. Okay. So the people right at the top, um, they're perfectly happy with this, and they will say, well, we're just serving a shareholder's interest. Middle management, I think, is absolutely not happy with it. And middle management these days begins only just below the chief executive, thanks to the extreme polarity of pay right at the top, in, in particular in U.S. corporations. So I think actually there's a good constituency for this. Actually, middle managers and career employees would like to see this happen. They would like to see a bigger role for employee voice and consultation. It doesn't have to be through German-style co-determination or works councils. It can be through less formal means than that of a sort which many companies already have. In the United States, for example, despite having no law about co-determination, most large companies do regularly consult their employees in some form or another. Um, and, of course, um, there should, I think, be a reprofessionalization of the managerial class. Right. So the most important thing that um, universities can do, and maybe this is true as much of business schools as of, as of law schools, is, is to stop teaching shareholder value type um, ethics and, and law to potential future corporate managers. Because I think if they saw their role more as stewards or, or trustees of the assets of the firm, they would approach it differently. And that is, by the way, the way they would have seen their role until pretty much the mid-1970s or early 1980s. That's what they all believed. I wonder if I could take you back to the philosophical puzzle, put your finger on it, maybe just you know, push you to say more about it. At the beginning of the paper, you criticized shareholder primacy theories that are based on the idea of shareholder ownership yeah. or mistaking the corporation as a thing that could be owned. Yeah. And yet now we're to treat the corporation as a resource. Yes. So is yes. there something in the nature of the corporation that counts as seeing it as a resource, seeing it as the sort of thing that's not susceptible to private property claims but is somehow susceptible to being a resource held in common. So I think it's definitely susceptible to, pro to property claims, but it's not exclusively owned by one um, constituency. So I, I guess we should be very careful. I, I've used the word, the word firm and the word corporation to mean different things, but of course sometimes um, it's impossible not to mix the two up. Okay, so maybe the firm is the, the commons. The corporation is a legal mechanism. But of course the corporation... Um, if my argument is correct, as a legal form, must also reflect this notion um, of, of the commons, which I've said the firm as a productive entity essentially is. So, of course, there are property rights inside the firm, there are property rights inside the corporation. It's just the corporation itself uh, isn't, isn't a thing. Right? But, but, but what yeah. is the firm in that sense, though? Is it right. just a collection of assets and income that's generated by an organization, or is it... Yeah. So is I think in a... Yeah. Organization? So I, I think in, a, in an economic or sociological sense, the organisation is the firm. So the firm is that sum total of, as I say, the, 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 the personal, physical, and these days we would say virtual assets, the intangibles, reputation, which are somewhere in the asset pool, often very unclearly defined, very unclearly defined. Okay? Uh, as long as the company is a going concern, we can define these property rights in all sorts of different ways. And often the, the law doesn't do this, but accounting does. Right. So we know from accounting practice and um, principles of accounting, there are ways of identifying um, through the methodology of accountancy these income claims and giving them a value. Okay. This goes on all the time, of course. A little, bit, a little bit away from company law, but it does go on. And so it's important to understand how things inside the company are valued for this purpose. And in fact, the evolution of accounting principles is an interesting and important subject in its own right, because views have changed and become a bit more market orientated. And they should be less market orientated, I think, less mark to market orientated than they, than they currently are. But of, of course, there are property rights inside the firm, as there are inside Ostrom's commons. It's just that the, the commons itself isn't an item of property that anybody can grasp and, and, and hold and remove. The commons is the source of these property claims and to some degree has to be above and beyond above and beyond them if it is to be sustained. So that's the sort of distinction I'm trying to apply to the legal setting too. So sure, the corporation is not a thing, but yes, there are shares, sure. There are IPRs, there are employee claims to wages, there's some set of assets over which the bank has security. Yep, there are lots of property rights inside the firm but the firm itself can't be, can't be owned. Yeah. I wonder if I could jump in here with a, a thought that tries to build on that question about the basic nature of property rights in the firm. Um, to a certain extent, you can, in our classic conception of property, you can draw an analogy to an organism, 
with a directing mind that manages its behavior and, and property empowers a person to manage assets. But here it seems, and this is a speculative thought that I offer for comment, that maybe the better metaphor is to an ecosystem. You have a system of different kinds of rights that interact with each other, but nonetheless operates as a system sustainably and productively. So we haven't, that's exactly right. And I think we haven't really understood the economics of the firm completely because there's been a tendency to, to just look at how corporate law does this to the exclusion of other areas of relevant law. Okay, so most company law scholars would say, well, we accept that we, we should take insolvency law into account. Okay, that's like the next door subject. But they, they don't generally look at employment law. They don't integrate tax law into their analysis. So they're missing part of the story. If we see it, as you say, as, a, as an ecosystem or, as, as I've said, as a resource, then we'd have to understand how these different areas of law interact. And often it's not clear how they do. So, for example, if we think about insolvency law, it's clear even from that case that shareholders don't have priority. Um, insolvency law is very much about excluding shareholders in favour of creditors at a particular point in the life cycle of the firm. And, of course, uh, corporate rescue laws can limit the creditors' rights, but they don't do so in order to protect the shareholders. They, by and large, do so in order to preserve the firm as a continuing um, entity for the benefit of the employees, customers, and others, who, and, and indeed the shareholders who benefit from it. Again, um, if we think about what employment law does here, it defines the business enterprise by using expressions like undertaking or sometimes workplace, which are just the particular linguistic terms employment law uses. They're different from those company law uses to describe the employment law issues which arise in, in this sort of context. So I think because we, as lawyers inevitably we focus on what we know, these fields are highly specialised, people rarely look at more than one or two, um, we might blanch at the prospect of grappling with tax law for example, very complicated, okay. All I'm saying is our approach might be informed by, by, by this sort of analysis and I think that we would see the firm differently and indeed we'd then go back to see company law itself differently if we saw it that way. Simon, uh, how do you respond? I, I, I think maybe you have not answered, given some clues to this, but how would you respond to the often heard argument that oh, let's keep things simple. Let's let each area of law focus on just one thing. Labor law, you know, uh, a lot of labor lawyers say, well, labor law is there to balance protecting employee interests with protecting productive employer there's a point of view it's a nonsense labor law just there to do one thing it's there to protect employee rights yeah. similarly on the corporate law side Roberto Romano yeah. said she said it at an earlier one of these, yeah. Yeah. these lectures um, the corporation only has one purpose and it's to protect shareholder value yeah. and if you if you require uh, directors and managers to look to other values are going to blur their obligations, you're going to confuse a corporate law should just to have a fixed point in going in, in one direction. Is there, is there an advantage to keeping things simple in that way and only giving each area of law one direction to look in? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, no, nobody would deny that labor law is basically about workers and company law is essentially about shareholders. But I, I think that a portion of labor law, a portion of company law and so forth is, is concerned with this issue I've been talking about, which is maintaining uh, the sustainability of the productive process understood more generally. Right, okay. So labor law performs an important coordinating role. Labor law is about protecting employees, but it's also about specifying the employer's property rights, for example, and, and always has been. Um, in the same way, um, I think a lot of company law uh, maybe before Roberta's influential work had its effect, was seen as being about maintaining uh, the, the structure of the firm in the sense I've been describing. If you go back 30 or 40 years to before the shareholder value revolution in company law, we had essentially a managerialist conception of company law where a lot of the cases and also a lot of the doctrine was about what shareholders couldn't do, right? being very clear about why shareholders couldn't run the firm. Now, that case law has never been reversed. We still don't have a system where shareholders have the right to manage 
the firm. So Berta would, I'm sure, fully accept. But I think this, this tradition has been eclipsed by, by the focus on, on shareholder claims. Because the consequence of focusing on the shareholder claim alone is that it, it, it creates a risk of depletion by, by that one group that, I, that I've been talking about. Now, of course, you might say, well, labour law will come in to provide a countervailing force, or tax law will come in to respect the public interest, okay, in taxes being paid. But, of course, um, this, this is creating the possibility within the legal order for a lot of conceptual confusion. Of course, it happens anyway. We have to think about how to make these areas of law reconcilable, but to make them reconcilable, we need a set of principles, and I think those principles can be derived from some of the things I've been talking about, in particular the, uh, the common design principles we've been discussing. Jennifer? We're always interested in how to divvy up the resource part, and I, and I find your idea really fascinating. I'm interested in knowing how the commons idea would play out with the less appealing part, which is there's the rights, but there's also the responsibilities of a, yeah. a collective person. How would liability play out? You mentioned a little bit about within that commons, how liability might fall, but how do you do that vis the others? And, and this is a debate even under the shareholder model. Sure. Who's, who should be holding the bag and for what? And there is, I think, even if we might argue the law is, is clear, although it may not be, certainly this debate about whether that's the right way to go. So how would the commons play out for liability? Just give an example of tort well, I, I think the, the, the implication of, of the approach I've been discussing is that we should, we should be a bit more sceptical than we are of the use of the corporate form to shift liabilities onto third parties. That the, the stakeholders can, under certain circumstances, clearly include victims of the firm's um, negligent uh, behaviour or otherwise. Um, and Hansman and Crackman accept this, in fact, in their article. They say that limited liability should be suspended in a case where third-party victims of a tort would otherwise be left completely defenceless because the incentives would then really be skewed. Right? So we should lift the corporate veil from time to time. We should say the firm and the corporation are two different things. The corporation is just a legal device and we should accept that it's a contingent one and we shouldn't allow too many flagrant abuses of the corporate form to proceed where the effect is clearly to... Uh, simply to shift the loss onto, um, onto those third parties. And they should be given a say as well in relation to the use of the corporate form to do that, as in effect uh, some litigation gives them. Now, clearly we're, we're talking here about something which is on the fringes of what most people would say is company law. Okay. Um, and I know at the same time that the, the use of the corporate form to create multi-corporate enterprises is critical to capital efficiency. And there may be no easy answer to the question when do we step over the line and when does something become an abuse of a right? Okay. But I'm pretty sure that the way the law currently goes, uh, it's much, much too easy to use a corporate form to shift liabilities in a way that's ultimately value reducing at, at a societal level. And we need a much more robust set of principles about the use of special purpose vehicles and other things like that and corporate avoidance to, to make headway here. And we also need to be very sceptical um, about corporate lobbying, because that's another part of this. Okay. Just as we expect or hope that companies will do more than the law minimally requires, that's corporate social responsibility, and also we hope they don't creatively try to avoid the spirit of the law, we should also accept that companies have a unique power to change legal rules for the worse. Right. Milton Friedman said, it's fine as long as companies stay within the letter of the law, but once companies themselves decide what that law is, as they increasingly do through their lobbying, then I think there's a real, a real problem, actually. Yeah. Um, for Deacon, I was wondering uh, to what extent do you think, I mean, if, you were, if this paradigm became dominant, um, that shareholders might be, become more hesitant, or potential shareholders might become more hesitant about investing in firms if, if they know that, wait a second, this firm isn't just being managed for my benefit, but there's all these other stakeholders involved who have that. Sure. So uh, a few years ago, Bob Monks and Alan Sykes wrote a paper uh, along the lines of why shareholder value is failing shareholders. Okay. So I think if, if my theory is correct, there must come a point where so-called shareholder-focused activity destroys shareholder value. 
because it leads to the depletion of the resource on which shareholder value ultimately depends. Now, that point may be hard to identify, but of course, that's the point. It's a collective action problem. That really is a tragedy of the commons. Right? Things done in the shareholders' names destroy shareholder value because we have the Enrons, we have the RBSs, we have the Lehmans and so on and so forth, which destroy value for shareholders. And I think many shareholder activists recognize this point. Like Bob Monks, they would say the managers um, are essentially still self-serving, but even more so, they're using shareholder rights as a facade, essentially, to, to maintain their position. And they're engaging in strategies which destroy corporate value. So, of course, th there will be many shareholder activists who will grumble at this. Okay. Um, uh, there will be um, people in the, the City of London who will say, uh, the very last thing we need is uh, fewer rights for shareholders. Um, I, I gave a, a talk on a slightly different theme a few years ago to, to academics and practitioners at which um, uh, an institutional investor was, was vehement in saying, whatever the arguments you may make in principle, the last thing we want managers to think is that they're off the hook in terms of shareholder responsibility. But my argument would be, where has this increased accountability got you as an institutional investor, right? Has it really made you better off? I'm not sure. Building on that point, I wonder if there's a line of research that might come out of your theory here that would take a new look at some of the older literature like um, Chandler's The Visible Hand and reinterpret that to provide a positive argument for why managing, you know, the, in the classic model of the, you know, as John Kenneth Galbraith used to refer to the, the man in the gray flannel suit, why that was a good thing for economic productivity and for shareholders. Well, I, I think we might be going back to that. I, I, I suspect that one, one consequence of the global financial crisis will be some, some rethinking of the role of, of management. I don't think the idea ever completely went away. I, I don't think we really completely deprofessionalized the managerial class, but we certainly have deprofessionalized it right at the top. Okay, I think that, that, that's, that's arguable because many of the very senior managers and chief executives of our listed companies um, actually are no longer professionally qualified to run those firms in the sense that they're not financial experts, they're not engineers, they're not experts in what those firms do, they're experts in deal making. Okay, RBS is a good example. Sir Fred Goodwin became the chief executive he wasn't qualified to run a bank, actually. He wasn't qualified in that area. He was qualified as a deal maker, and deals were what he did. And he built RBS from almost nothing to become this enormous bank, which then completely failed in the financial crisis because it was overextended by hostile takeover bid activity. This pattern is repeated across the listed company sector. The most senior people are there because they can handle shareholder value concerns. They're not engineers. They're not experts. In what, and they should be. They, 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 they ought to be. And I think we should go back as well to a system whereby the most important source of monitoring for what managers do is other managers. Right. Okay. Monitoring by other managers is often much more effective than monitoring by independent directors or monitoring by outside shareholders who do not understand the firm from the inside. In the case of independents and shareholders have limited loyalty to the firm, but actually career employees have very strong incentives to monitor effectively what their bosses do. Now, this is a model which um, um, can be justified by reference to practice in some countries. Uh, there are theoretical papers discussing this, a recent paper by uh, Acharya and his colleagues. So I think there's quite a lot of theoretical work and also empirical work to say internal monitoring can be a viable alternative to um, external shareholder-based or capital-based monitoring. And that's where I think we might, we might look for, for some thoughts on how to take this forward. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, I'd like to thank our speaker, Simon Deacon, once again, for a very stimulating talk. Thank you.